Please stand and join us as we sing our opening song. to worship from Paul David Tripp. Sunday matters. We gather to be comforted as we remember that God loves us and to remember that he has called us to a way of living that is infinitely better than anything we could have chosen for ourselves. Friends, as we continue our series, discovering the book of Acts and the ways in which the apostles are infused with the Holy Spirit to do the work of God, let us remember that we, too, have been called to this way of living. Let us worship together with prayer and praise. Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, just as Jesus empowered the disciples of the early church, he empowers us today. 
just as you called the church into being and gave spiritual gifts to the apostles, you give those gifts to us today to be the church in this place and beyond these walls. We give thanks that you infuse us with your Holy Spirit so that we could minister in your name and for your sake. We offer our gratitude today for mothers and for all women who mother the world through their teaching, guidance, loving, disciplining, discipling, and influencing us all. For those whom this day stirs fresh grief or deep pain, remind us of the words of scripture that tell us that you, O oh God, love us like a nursing mother loves her infant child. This love from you surpasses all human love and will never fail us. And yet at times we feel so disconnected from you and haven't felt the powerful sense of your presence when we endure difficult days or confusing situations. We struggle with illness and loss, sin and disappointment, addiction and fragile mental health. We pray then for those who sit next to us, those who are connected to us online, those whose names we whisper in our hearts, and we pray for ourselves as well. We pray for courage and endurance for days that seem hard and long, knowing that you're not far off, but you are with us as you promised to the end of the age. Merciful God, forgive us when we fail you and set, set us on paths you desire for us to journey. Lead us and guide us day by day by your inspiration as you reveal your word to us empowering us to love and serve in the name of Jesus, our Lord. We give you thanks for loving us more than we could ever fathom and giving us abundant life through the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we lift our prayers today, we join our voices with the voice of Jesus, praying in the way he taught us, saying, We learn from Acts that the early church was filled with people who shared what they had, who worshiped together, ate together, prayed for one another, and helped those in need. This was a community of peace and harmony. Let us reflect on such peacefulness as we share signs of fellowship with one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Please take a moment to greet your neighbor. And with you.
may be seated. And I'd like to invite all the kids who are here this morning to come forward for a few minutes together. Come on over, guys. Come on over. <laughs> hey, Spencer, you want to come hang out up here, bud? <laughs> I got that answer. I know who wins there. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. How we doing on this beautiful day? You all look wonderful. Today is a very special day, isn't it? Yes. yes. Do you know what makes today so special? Because it's Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day, a day where we celebrate how blessed we are to have women who influence our lives and teach us and guide us with wisdom and truth and, and just love us in incredible ways. And so I want to ask you a few questions about your moms. Would you answer some questions for me? Yeah? Let me see. Can anybody tell me what's your very favorite thing about your mom? What is that? Everything. Everything. Okay, that's a good answer. Anybody else? What's your favorite thing about your mom? Oh, I'm sorry. You want me to take the mic away? Does that make you nervous? Nothing. What's that? Nothing. Everything? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, you mean... I know that you mean she does nothing wrong, right? That's right. That's what you mean. Loving. What is that? Loving. She's loving. What else? Anything else you can think of? Your favorite thing about your mom? Yeah. Playing with my mommy. Playing with your mom? Yeah, having fun. Awesome. Sharing. Sharing. She shares with us, and she teaches us how to share too, right? Anything else? Being your mom, that's a wonderful thing. Awesome, awesome. Well, let me ask you this. You, you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but what's your favorite thing to do with mom? What do you love to do with mom? You, part of you talk about playing with your mom. You love to play. What else? Go, what? Out. Go out? Go have a girl's day. Go have a girl's day. What do you do on a girl's day? Go shopping. Go shopping. All right. Anybody else? Does that sound fun? Yeah? What? <laughs> we have lots of amens over here. Sounds fun. Well, what's something important mom has taught you? Can you think? What's something important mom's taught you? What do you think? What's that? To be a good mom. She's shown you how to be a good mom. Set a good example. Yeah? Yeah. Anything else? Well, let me ask you this. What does mom do that tells you she loves you? How do you know mom loves you? What does she do? Hugs and kisses. Hugs and kisses. Yeah? What else? What does mom do to show you that she loves you? <laughs> we all look very dapper this morning. Did you get up and get your own clothes together and get ready all on your own? Pick out your... Did you buy your own clothes? <laughs> no. No. Did you get it on a girl's day? Maybe. All right. <laughs> but think about all the ways our moms provide for us and support us. Yeah. My, my mommy helps me get off my clothes out for me. Yeah, helps you get out your clothes and do get ready for each day, be ready, do our homework, learn how to read. What? I play pop job. Play, play Paw Patrol. All right. Man, we are so blessed with the many ways that moms love us and the, the things they do. Could, do you think it would be a good thing for us to pray for moms? Yeah? Do you think being a mom is easy? No. I mean, there we, that looks unanimous, right? It's kind of hard because we always listen to everything mom says the first time right away, don't we? Yeah, well, I don't know. Sometimes it, it can be a little hard. And so let's just have a word and, and say to all of our moms, all of the women of influence in our lives, mothers, stepmothers, aunts, grandmothers, teachers, 
thank you for the seeds of faith and faithfulness and wisdom that you impart. I know that I am here. Uh, I've been blessed by my mother, my grandmother, but also I had a very special aunt who always was at everything in my life. I had a Sunday school teacher uh, who showed up every single week to teach me God's word. I remember her, and, and she was my third grade Sunday school teacher. And I'll be honest with you, I was kind of a difficult third grader. And I bet if she knew now that I was a pastor, she would just lose her mind and say, what, in, what is the church coming to? But man, she was faithful. And so to all of you women of influence who invest in the lives of children, we want to say a word of thank you. And will you join me in recognizing our mothers and women who invest seeds of truth? And we're going to say a prayer for moms. Anybody want to say a prayer for moms? Okay, I knew that was a lot to ask. Do you want to? Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Amen, amen. Can we pray together? Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, on this day we pause to give thanks and just to recognize with a fresh and worthy perspective of how blessed we are for the women who influence our lives with your goodness, with your godliness, with your wisdom, and with your truth. And God, we are so thankful for the special ministry of motherhood. And Lord, we know that the hours are long. The job description is always changing. The recognition and appreciation is underwhelming and not what it should be. And so we pray, Lord, that you would just be with each and every woman who serves in the role of mother, who influences as a teacher, as a mentor, as a coach, who invests in future generations. Lord, we pray that you would just infuse them with strength and perseverance, with energy, uh, and just to continue to do the good things that they do to bless the generations. And God, we just give you thanks for all those who have influenced and blessed our lives in special ways. And we pray that each one would feel especially celebrated on this day and every day for all the work they do. And we pray this in the powerful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Well, thank you all so much for sharing today. I hope you have some special plans today to celebrate mom. And we'd love for you to stay for the rest of worship or Miss Debbie's ready for Children's Church.
This morning at Southminster Church, we continue our study of the book of Acts as we seek to learn lessons of faithfulness from the early Christians. We have seen the growing animosity between the Jewish leaders who had crucified Jesus and the Christians who continue to proclaim he is the Savior of the world and the Son of God. In Acts chapter 22, the Jewish leaders had seized Paul in an attempt to kill him. Paul was arrested and held by the Roman officials just to keep the peace. Then in Acts 23, Paul is on trial as the Roman officials seek to understand the Jewish anger. An assembly of Jewish leaders, the Sadducees and Pharisees, and Paul is called together before the Roman commander. This is what we read in Acts 23. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, my brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good consciousness to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there and judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize this was the high priest, for it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, called out to the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and Sadducees. The assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe in both of these things. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, you must also testify about me in Rome. Well, this week, as I've been reading through the book of Acts, a couple of things struck me. First of all, I've shared with you before that I'm a John Grisham fan. And boy, as I've turned the pages of Paul's trial, his arrest, the things that are happening, I found, man, this is as gripping as any modern novel. Just the, the drama that's unraveling here and as it was portrayed in the video introduction and the things that are happening But I'm also reading through these pages in preparation for our time of worship each week and thinking about what we can learn as God's people, the the wisdom we can glean from these stories. And as I came to the story that we just saw portrayed in Acts chapter 23, and as I was reading 
through Paul's situation and circumstance, I, I thought to myself, boy, Paul is really doing things right. He is living in a very righteous way, very obedient, and yet he's being treated very poorly. And it caused me to look at this text in a little bit different way and say, you know, what can we as the people of God learn from this situation when, when we're living right and being treated wrong? But before I get into that sermon and that message for today and share these observations with you, I just want to see if this message was even necessary. Is this a sermon we even need? Is there anybody here who has ever been living right, doing the right things, and you're still being treated wrong, being treated poorly? How about any of our young people, any of our students? Have you ever been uh, doing your work diligently in school and you're, you're doing what is expected and desired of you and you're doing a great job and, and you stand out and you get recognition and because you're, you're doing things well, maybe you become the object of some adversity. People start to pick on you for being a teacher's pet or, or doing something great or getting recognition or they question why you always get the awards or, or, or recognition. Or maybe in some of our relationships, whether they be friendships or dating relationships or even engagements or marriages, have you ever been trying to live your life with integrity and, and purity and, and living in, in holiness and righteousness and, and your life is moving in a direction and maybe your partner, whether you be somebody you're dating or a friend or even a, a fiance or, or even a spouse is, is moving in a different direction and there becomes animosity between the two of you. Maybe it even leads to a broken relationship. Or maybe in the workplace or among your college friends. You ever have some friends from when you were growing up and as you become an adult and you start to make different decisions and apply God's wisdom to your life and, and move in a different direction and, 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 and maybe they say, boy, what has happened to you? You are getting old. You're a wet blanket. You're no fun. Or moms. Moms, have you ever sought to do what's best for your family and for your children to guide them in wisdom and truth and, and every once in a while perhaps it's not received with overwhelming gratitude? You ever try to, thank you, <laughs> I'll take that as an amen, right? Anybody ever experience any of those situations or circumstances where you're living right? Go ahead, raise your hand if, you, if you've been there. You're doing the right thing and you're receiving negative feedback. Okay, I'm glad I saw a few hands because if you, there were no hands and you said, we don't really need this message, I don't know what we would have done. You would have called my bluff on that. But anyway, it, it seems like it is necessary. This is something that we face in our life. There are times where we are living right and being treated wrong. And that's exactly what we see and what we can learn from this story in Acts chapter 23. And so let's look at the example that we can see from the Apostle Paul. What does he do when he is living right and being treated wrong? Well, the first thing I observe from Paul's behavior is that he keeps his integrity. Look at these opening verses. Paul looks straight at the Sanhedrin. Now, let me clarify real quick. The Sanhedrin is a governing body. It's an organized body of governance, but it's made up of different parties, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They're both Jewish religious leaders, but they have different perspectives and opinions. They don't agree on everything. So the Sanhedrin is a, a governing body. It's a, a special council, if you will, but they're made up of different groups. So Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Those who were standing near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Now, let's unpack what's happening here in this story. First of all, Paul says, I have done my duty to God in a good conscience. Paul is doing the right thing. He is living right. He is living faithfully. 
And then the high priest had those standing near him punch him in the face. So here we see Paul is doing the right thing and being treated wrongly. Now, Paul doesn't swing back. (laughs) He doesn't reciprocate the, the punch in the face. He says God will strike you. He trusts God. He puts his faith and hope in God to resolve this. And then when he's told that he's speaking to the high priest, he apologizes to the one who is responsible for him being hit in the face for doing nothing wrong. So notice how in this situation and circumstance, Paul keeps his integrity. You know, a lot of times when we're living right and being treated wrong, it is so tempting to just get in the mud, right? (laughs) Fight fire with fire. You know, we see all the things that Jesus says that when we're struck, we should turn the other cheek. When somebody forces us to go one mile, we should go two miles. We hear all that nice, good Jesus stuff, and we we know what we should do. But when we're living right and being treated wrong, when we're being treated unfairly, it is so hard to follow the example of Christ. It is so tempting to fight fire with fire. It's so tempting to treat others the way we are being treated, to reciprocate with with anger or frustration or slander or nastiness. But Paul keeps his integrity. I was having a conversation with one of our students about a situation that they were facing. They were in a circumstance, I won't give away their details, but it's a great example. There was a situation where a coach, an instructor, a teacher had a certain standard and expectation about what they were supposed to do. And this individual was meeting that standard and that expectation and doing what they were supposed to do. It just so happened that they were one of the few individuals in that group that was meeting the expectation and the standard of the teacher. And so the other individuals in that group began to make them the point of animosity and they began to hear some uh, nasty things that were said about them and they were tempted to, to slide back, right? To not shine so brightly. And boy, is it tempting that when we are in these situations and we're being treated wrong for living right. It's, it's tempting to reciprocate and treat others the way we're treated. It's tempting to lower our standards, to try not to shine so bright or try not to stand out or, or be tempted to, to not do as we're guided or instructed. But notice that in this situation, the first thing that Paul does when he's living right and being treated wrong is he keeps his integrity. We should not reduce our standards just because others don't live by the same standards. It may be your integrity that got you into this situation. Let it be your integrity that guides you out. So the first thing we see from Paul is to keep our integrity. Second thing I observed in this situation and circumstance from Paul is he kept his mind right. He kept a right and true perspective about that situation. He didn't get all disoriented and frustrated. He kept his mind right. He kept a right and true perspective. Look at verse 6. Then Paul, knowing that some of those in the gathering, some of the Sanhedrin were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, he called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I'm a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the the Sadducees. I I love what happens here. It's almost comical when you really understand it. So again, the Sanhedrin is a ruling council, but it's made up of some Sadducees and some Pharisees. They're all Jewish leaders, but they don't have the same opinions on all things. In fact, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They thought when you die, you die, that's it. Which calls into question all kinds of other theological thoughts about what's the point of religion and and God if, if this life is it. But we won't get into all of that now. But here's the thing. Here's what I love about Paul. He understood the situation. He understood the environment. And I'm not saying he was underhanded, but he was very strategic. He kept his mind and he kept his perspective. And so in the middle of Paul's trial, 
made up of these two groups that have different opinions. He just lobbed a hot button issue right in the middle of it and let them start arguing with each other. A modern day equivalent would be as if they were the special counsel of Congress. And they were examining or, or putting someone on trial and they were examining them. And in the middle of this individual's examination, uh, this individual just said something about a hot button issue of the day about abortion or border control or inflation or the budget or Israel Palestine. They just threw out their perspective and all of a sudden, instead of focusing on the individuals, the Republicans and Democrats started arguing about the issue. And they forgot that they were there to try this individual. That would be a modern-day equivalent of what Paul's doing here. He keeps his mind about him. He understands his circumstance. He, he assesses the situation. And Paul doesn't go to that place of being overwhelmed by doom and despair. He doesn't become a victim. He doesn't cry out, oh, God, why me? I am being so faithful. And he was. Paul's going from town to town, building churches, getting flogged and beat with an inch of his life. He's on trial for the single reason that he is proclaiming that Jesus has risen from the dead. And he's sharing that gospel news with everyone he encounters. That's, that's what he's being accused of. And yet even in this, Paul keeps his mind about him. He doesn't allow himself to become a, a victim. He, he uses his God-given intelligence in the middle of this situation to think strategically and think clearly and to have a right and true perspective. So when we're living right and being treated wrong, we keep our mind. We keep a right and true perspective perspective. We know that our perspective, how we think about our situation, our circumstance, how we think about ourselves is so critical. Neuroscientists recognize that our perception comes first. How we think about things impacts our health and how we feel. When we think positively and when we are encouraged and when we have hope, it, it releases chemicals in our body that, that bring peace and, and joy and comfort. When we have defeated thoughts, when we assume the worst, when we get discouraged and full of despair, it releases chemicals in our body that, re that, are, that produce stress and anxiety. How we think and how we perceive ourselves is so critical to our mental and physical health, how we understand ourselves. That's why it's so important that when, especially in these times of conflict, when we feel like we're being, when we're doing the right thing and being treated wrong, that we keep our mind, we keep the right and true perspective of who we are and whose we are. And it's a good time to think about those things that can dilute or distract our perspective. As we're seeking in these times of challenge or hardship, as we're seeking a right and true perspective, we got to be careful of the traps that can confuse us or even distract us. Whether it's our fancy phones that lead us to a world of social media and a whole bunch of different ideas and perspectives that can confuse our own right and true assessment of who we are, whether it comes from friends or family or, or other opinions that are out there that just get us off the rails. Or if we just try to distract ourselves from the challenge we're facing, whether it's in the form of a, a pill or a substance or a bottle or even a credit card and a clearance sale. If we're trying to distract ourselves from the situation. I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> we try, <laughs> what, <laughs> if we are trying to just distract ourselves, occupy our mind, it's so important that we keep our mind right. Keep a clear perspective of who we are and whose we are. The next thing that Paul did in this story is he lived by example. So we keep our integrity, we keep our mind right, and we live by example. There was a great uproar in some of the teachers as the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees are arguing with each other. Some of the teachers of law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man. Look at what they said. What if? What if a spirit or an angel is speaking to him? 
What if he is telling us the words of God? Now, we're going to move from, uh, to, to outcomes here, right? We talked about keep your, uh, keep your integrity, keep your mind right. And, and what does that produce, the kind of outcomes? Well, live by example. When we keep our integrity, when we keep our mind right, we live by example. And look how Paul's example is starting to influence the audience here. Starting to sway the crowd. This is a group of people who gathered to try him in order to kill him. That's all they want to do. And yet because Paul has kept his integrity, because Paul has kept his wits about him, because Paul has made the presentation, he is starting to live an example that is transformative. Others in that crowd are trying, starting to be swayed to his perspective. You know, as we're called to be salt and light, we're called to live distinctively. And, and when we live distinctively, it'll make an impact. And here we see that influence. And think about the blessing that comes from this. Here we have Pharisees that had originally gathered to put Paul on a false trial, a fabrication of justice. And, and, and here they, they come and under these pretense, and yet they're starting to be swayed. Wait, maybe, maybe he is telling us something important. Maybe God is speaking through him. Maybe we should listen. And so they are being influenced positively, but then what are they doing? They're coming to bat for Paul. <laughs> they're saying, hey, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. We support him. And so Paul is being supported by them. And you know what, friends? That's what I, I, I've just come to learn in my life, in my personal relationship with Christ, in, in my ministry. It's just one of those truths. In God, in God's great big cosmic understanding that is so far beyond our own understanding, it, we, we see time and time again, when we do the right thing, when we live the right way, others are blessed and then ultimately we are blessed. And don't take that in that theology where, hey, do good, get a cookie, do bad, get a lightning bolt, right? That's not how God works. And yet God's wisdom is so profound that it does work out that when we are obedient and when we are faithful, it leads to blessing in the world around us and ultimately in our life. Now, it may not always look like that. It may not be obvious. Paul is still on trial, we do see blessing when we live an example. When you're living right and being treated wrong, continue to live out an example. And the final thing that Paul does here that I think is so important, he lives his life, he lets go and lets God. Look at verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Now think about all the assurance that Paul gets from this simple statement. First of all, just the reminder that God's with him, that he's doing the right thing. But also a reminder of his survival. As you will testify, what you're doing in Jerusalem, you're going to do it in Rome too. You're going to survive this encounter in Jerusalem and you're going to go on to do it in Rome. Live your life. Let go and let God. Trust God. Even when we're living right and being treated wrong, even when things are unfair and we don't feel like they're going our way, continue to to do the right thing. Now, look, this isn't easy. I, I'm not going to pretend to stand up here in front of you and say, hey, here's four little ingredients, and no matter what you're facing, if you just put these four little things together, it'll be magic pixie dust on all your problems, and they'll just go away. The majority still wanted to kill Paul. That's the reality. His problems didn't just go away. He was learning how to navigate the challenges that he was facing, but they didn't just go away. In fact, as we read this week, there are some who had taken a vow that they would not eat until they had killed Paul. I don't know about where you're from, but from where I'm from, that's a pretty serious vow. 
I don't give up food for a lot. These people were determined they were going to kill Paul. These four things don't just magically come together, and if you apply them, and if you live with and keep your integrity and keep your mind right and set an example and let go and let God or just trust God, everything's going to be fine. But you know what it does? It helps us navigate those hardships. It doesn't mean they're all going to go away. And it helps us remember who's in charge. Right, you know, if, if you've been here and participating for, I, I'm not in love with this phrase, let go and let God. There are applications where it has some theological holes. Right, but in this instance, in this application where we use it to remind ourselves God is in control. God's got this. It's a very healthy application. And remember those words. I think one of the epitomes of this is those words when Paul was struck in the face. Remember what he said. God will strike you. He didn't retaliate. He didn't reciprocate. He didn't start swinging back. He just remembered. God's got this. I don't have to fight this fight. And I think that's one of the key promises, key realities for us. When we're in the middle of conflict, when we feel like we're being treated wrong, even though we're living right, remember God's got this. Paul realized that he didn't have to win this battle because God's won the war. Because of that eternal victory, he knew that God was with him. He knew that God was good. He knew that God is just. He knew that God would handle this. And he knew that God had victory secured for him. And when we can just live in that truth, it takes the, the pressure off us to win every battle, to have the last word, to, to get in the mud with people who are slinging mud, to fight fire with fire. We can just trust in the eternal truths and promises that God's got this. I know it's hard when you're living right and being treated wrong. I know it feels very unfair. And I'm not going to stand here and promise you can just do these four things, it'll all go away. That's just not reality. But the example we have in Christ, the example we have in Paul, the faithful example is that when we're living right and being treated wrong, if we will keep our integrity, if we will keep our minds and perspectives right, if we will live an example and if we'll trust God, let God take care of it. And we too can navigate these hardships as Paul did. Let's pray together this morning. God, we thank you for your wisdom and for your truth to us and for us. God, we've all been in those situations and circumstances where we're being treated poorly unfairly. We're being treated wrong even though we're doing right. God, we confess we are never perfect. We're always sinners who have fallen short, but we pray, Lord, that when we are doing our best to be faithful and when that faithfulness leads to adversity, we pray, Lord, that we would just lean into your presence. Holy Spirit, will you guide us in your word and your will and in your ways? as we continue to seek to be your people. Follow the example of Christ and those who have followed him and set a path for us. We pray, God, that we would be faithful in all you entrust us. And we pray this in the powerful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, we now have the opportunity to continue to worship God as the praise team leads us this morning's offering will be received. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. 
I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every stronghold Shine through the shadows
Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, thank you for the profound privilege it is to gather as your people, to return to you a portion of the blessing that's been bestowed upon us. And God, we pray that you will take this offering and multiply it and use it for your purposes. Help us to be your people, faithfully guiding people to you and who you are, representing you in our community and around the world. We thank you, God, for your blessing on our lives and pray that we will be a blessing to all we encounter. And we pray this in the powerful and mighty name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Friends, please remain standing and join us in our sending song. celebrated today in the ways that, that are encouraging and uplifting and truly recognize all you do for your families and for our community. Second, I want to remind you that next Sunday is going to be a very special Sunday here as we gather. We will recognize the graduating class of 2024, and we'll also have a Pentecost potluck after worship. So we hope you'll plan to join us, bring a dish or a dessert to share, and, and join us after worship for a very special time of fellowship. But brothers and sisters, as we go forward from this time of worship, let's go forward as the hands and feet of Jesus representing him in all we do think and say. And as you go, may the grace, mercy, and peace, which comes from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be upon each and every one of you this day and every day forevermore. Amen. <laughs>